what's going on everybody this is john jake gaming on the mic here coming at you with a brand new episode of the fcs dynasty here on ncaa06 featuring the next mod as well as we are closing in on two thirds of the way through the regular season conference championships get into serious con consideration now and it's just gonna be a fun episode we're gonna have a fun time here don't go anywhere eight games of exciting fcs action coming your way here and i hope you guys are excited for it if you are make sure you go ahead smack that like button hit that subscribe button if you have to be brand new if you want to see big plays like this throughout the channel and that is the star receiver jacob hill that comes through and makes that catch and now sacramento state in a serious position to put points on the board and that is a big time run by willie Hendricks, finding the end zone touchdown hornets how about willie Hendricks willing his way into the end zone may have not had the best vision that might have been that trent richardson vision right there for being completely honest but that being said it does lead to a touchdown now we'll see if montana state can get points up on the scoreboard as well after we did see Corey hall who's not accustomed by the way did throw that interception but it does not go anywhere so it does remain a seven nothing game for right now but throwing over to the right hand side it's carlos espinoza who's gonna make the catch just outside of the red zone and that's just a nice job working that curl and go route so now it will be first and 10 from the 23 yard line as Corey Hall will line up under center. Got trips to the left. Hall throws to the left hand side quickly. He's going to find his receiver down the sideline and no one is going to catch him on his way into the end zone. That's a touchdown for Sacramento State and the Hornets are going to be stinging here early on. They will be taking a 14 nothing lead here to get things going. Later on in the first half, Montana State does get the goose eggs off the scoreboard. They do at least make it 14-3 as Hall sets his feet, throws to the right-hand side, and throws an absolute bullet there. Johnson trying to get his boys set for another red zone score. And Sacramento State has been pretty sound in the red zone this year. 80% of their scores uh, from the red zone. Trying to make that higher than 80%, but that does get deflected away at the very last second trying to find espinoza in the back of the end zone but threw it a little too late so now with second and ten instead as carl's hall faces the pressure throws to the right hand side and carl espinoza finds the end zone touchdown hornets and it's now gonna be 21 to 3 and how does maurice billings lead his troops back in the first half trying to make really anything happen it looks like it's gonna be sacramento state's day all the way as brad davis is gonna take it all the way back to the crib a 43 yard touchdown to end things here in the first half of action so 28 to 3 is your score i mean that's exactly where marie montana state wants them if you're a falcons fan you know all too well gonna throw over to the right hand side does find a receiver that's kev stamper one of your guys is customs that catches the touchdown pass from maurice billings to end the first half of action so at least montana state finds some offensive rhythm before the end of the half we'll see if they can carry that into the next quarter the third quarter of action and maurice billings gets absolutely clobbered that felt like sean taylor coming in there and making a play r.i.p to the great sean taylor but he certainly got his bell rung no pun intended it is now going to be first and 10 from the 49 yard line throwing over to the left hand side it's jacob hill who mosses a defender and then proceeds to dive his way into the end zone touchdown hornets i'm sure they're feeling a little horny on the offensive side of the ball right now it's going to be 35 to 10 and we still have a quarter of a half left to play how does Maurice Billings respond, though? He did throw. Uh, actually, he turned the ball over last time out. We'll see if that continues as he tries to throw over to the right-hand side. This one does end up being completed. That was, of course, in double coverage. Tim Amaska 
one of your guys' custom was there to help assist on the tackle there. And it's now at the 48-yard line as Billings trying to continue to drive over the middle of the field. And to be honest, I am really not sure who ended up throwing that football. Like, what are we doing? What are we actually doing here? I have no idea. Billings was trying to throw over the middle of the field and could have been looking for one of his receivers, but he just simply wasn't open there straight up and down. And now going back to the left-hand side, but we do see Corey Hall also throw an interception. And listen, Corey Hall is not perfect. He threw a couple of interceptions in this game. We do know him as a very gunslinger-like mentality. He has thrown 17 interceptions on the season it's been that kind of year but he can push the ball downfield and he's got a very good supporting cast as well as you just saw right there sacramento state forcing yet another turnover and the hornets who did come in ranked number three in the entire country they showed why they're ranked as one of the best teams in the country they win 56 to 10 and now they're gonna be seven and one so we'll go ahead and check in on a top 25 matchup our First top 25 matchup that we got going on here in this episode. Uh, a miss in week number 10 action. And in terms of conference play, though, they've been going in two different directions. Weaver State is a team that is currently in the hunt to win that conference championship. With Sacramento State winning, Weaver State needs to win this game to keep up. But North Dakota State, though, the Bison, they have had a really down season so far. They're still ranked in the top 25, but... They're 0-3 in conference play. That's a massive yikes. So we'll see if the Bison can win their first conference game so that they can remain in the top 25. And this is one way to do it with Rod Montez. The season, one offseason custom. He's a senior now. And that's what you need. You need your impact guys to make impact plays on the game. And that's exactly what we got from Rod Montez. He'll run it all the way into the end zone. Touchdown for the Bison. And it's a 7-0 affair. But now, Evelyn Thomas tries to go to work. But early on, I don't know if it's the bright lights. The Weaver State has not defeated North Dakota State yet in this series. And the fact that it's a top 25 matchup on national television is the moment a little bit too big for Evelyn Thomas, who just threw that interception. Later on in the game, it's 10 to nothing, and one reason why North Dakota State has struggled is because of the quarterback play, and you can see why, you know, trying to make that transition to where they're passing the football a little bit more often. They are still a run-heavy team, but trying to use that quarterback play because the quarterbacks are not really built to run the triple option, at least not nearly as much. They're not scrambling time quarterbacks, but it has been a little bit of a pain to deal with. But North Dakota State still has a 13-0 lead. Tom is going to throw over the middle of the field. He does find a receiver. His receiver is off to the races. He might score here, and he does. So that is how Weber State gets up on the scoreboard. That might have been a 69-yard touchdown, which I don't know about you guys. But that sounds very nice. And what's nice for Weber State as well is that they cut this to just a one possession game. As again, thrown over the left hand side. Garrett Keith trying to do anything, but that's going to be another interception. Weber State now in a position all of a sudden to come out here and take the lead. We might see a lead change in this game. North Dakota State has been in charge the whole time, but. Weaver State cannot take advantage, unfortunately. So it still remains that one possession game. And getting a stop, certainly critical as we start the fourth quarter of action. Still running. That triple option. Thought about pitching at the last second, but quarterback will keep it. And they will still find their way into the end zone. They will try for the two-point conversion, but the two-point conversion is no good. So here we are early in the fourth quarter as Aveline Thomas is looking to get his troops downfield. And you got to get quick points up on the scoreboard. That's just how it has to go. We'll see if Aveline Thomas can lead his troops down the field. Passing again here on a key passing down. Passing situation. Throwing over the middle of the field. And then it's going to be caught for a nice completion. Aveline Thomas now closing in 
on 200 yards passing on the day. Later on in the drive, second and goal from the free yard line. They actually choose to run the football and they find their way into the end zone. Touchdown, Weber State. And after an empty possession for the Bison, Aveline Thomas actually has a chance to win. And that is a big time throw over on the perimeter. And Weber State moving the ball downfield. Are we going to see a fourth quarter comeback? Or will the Bison win their very first conference game here in season number five? Thomas throws to the right hand side. And it's going to be intercepted. The pain and the heartbreak is just part of the trials and tribulations as you go on that upward ladder to eventually be a national champion so weaver state will end up losing a heartbreaker in this one as north dakota state wins 19 to 14 in what was a pretty defensive battle overall but the bison do end up prevailing and they will indeed win their very first conference game here in season number five despite the fact that the bison they couldn't even amass 200 yards total offense in this one so now we put our focus on yet another team that's currently in the top 25 right now the sanford bulldogs who are currently ranked number 16 in the country they'll be taking on murray state who is not ranked in the AP Top 25, at least not right now, but they are certainly in the thick of the conference championship race. They're 3-1, and, and they're also chasing Southeast Missouri State, so a big game on the road for the Murray State Racers, so that if they can find a way to win this game, they can keep up with Southeast Missouri State, who does play later in this episode. A little bit of spoiler for you guys. And possibly get into the Top 25, but that is not how you want to start a game out whatsoever as Bobby McNeil just throws it right into the hands of Larry Peterson who gets just his second career interception and it's going to be a very memorable interception here as well so now Sanford has a 7-0 lead here early as Bobby McNeil tries to go back to work this time trying to take a shot down the field and listen man sometimes it's simply better to be lucky than it is to be good Look at the coverage here. You would expect this to be an incompletion at the bare minimum. Do not get that. And now, Murray State's in the red zone. A chance to tie this game. But wait, the ball is on the ground. And Sanford is going to recover. So Sanford with a red zone stand. And this game will remain 7-0 in favor of the Sanford Bulldogs. Next drive though, Sanford could not do anything with the turnover, so they will go back to the air. They still believe in that Bobby McNeil, but does Bobby McNeil believe in himself? I don't know if he has it here today. Is that already a second interception here in the first quarter of action? This time, one of your customs, Jabari Thomas, does come down with the interception. And now Sanford with a chance to add points on the scoreboard before we go into the half, and sure enough, it's caught in the end zone touchdown Sanford and the Bulldogs will indeed take a 14 to 3 lead into halftime a team that is trying to also keep pace with Southeast Missouri State second half action picking up now as Bob McNeil looking to continue firing down the field this time he throws a dime to start the second half McNeil Starting to get a little bit more comfortable in this football game. And now it's back to just a one possession game. And Murray State even with a chance to possibly take the lead. But Murray State ends up getting sacked by Ronnie Schuler. And Schuler having a solid collegiate career here at the FCS level. That is his 14th career sack. And it leads to his second and 14. Which leads to yet another sack. This time, it's one of the edge rushers able to get home. And Murray State, they have been solid on third down, but third for 21. Is that too much to ask? And it is three consecutive plays in a row, which end up being sacks. You literally cannot make this up. And it was a promising drive for the Murray State Racers, but after three sacks in a row... 
You absolutely hate to see it. And now Sanford gets the ball back in their hands, but they will not be bringing out their offense out onto the field as we will see them find the end zone again. This time it's from their special teams unit. So, you know, a little bit of a team effort here for the Sanford Bulldogs as we got an offensive touchdown, a defensive touchdown, and a special teams touchdown on the way to a 21-10 lead against a frankly underrated Murray State squad. Their FCS playoff hopes are not done. No shame in losing to a top 20 team on the road. But Murray State will need to finish strong if they do want to be considered as an at-large if they cannot make up ground in the Big Ten Conference. So we've seen some good gameplays so far, but we also get in some simulated games, you know, for the first half of this episode. And boy, do we have a surprising game or two. First off, how about the Howard Bison upsetting the Rattlers of Florida A&M 39-31 as Florida A&M takes their second loss of the season. However, James Madison, they do take care of business against North Carolina A&T State as the Dukes win 38-16 in order to get to 7-1 on the season. And of course, the Western Carolina Catamounts, they still remain undefeated but face a serious challenge from Alabama A&M. Only a one-point win as Western Carolina gets to 7-0 on the season. Now, that being said, we do have Oral Roberts going to town against St. Thomas on the road. They win 51-10 as your final score as Oral Roberts has been flying under the radar but having a good season so far, sitting at 6-3. As for New Mexico State, they take a loss on the road to a fellow conference opponent, Stephen F. Austin, as Stephen F. Austin wins 45-23. New Mexico State will likely be out of the top 25. Meanwhile, the Akron Zips went on the road to take on the Illinois State Redbirds, and Illinois State gave it everything that they had, but simply did not have the firepower needed. Illinois State loses 17-10 to the number two team in America, the Akron Zips. But we do have another blowout to report as the Temple Owls seek to get back into the top 25 after their big loss to Florida A&M. They beat Western Michigan in non-conference play 35 to nothing, and they're now 6-2 on the season. New Hampshire, meanwhile, is able to stay in the top 25, but it still feels like they're underperforming. They do beat Morgan State on the road 35-28 as they're now 5-3 on the year. Eastern Illinois is also able to handle its business in conference play as well as they beat Western Kentucky 31-24. Eastern Illinois is now 5-2 on the season. Northwestern State also finding its groove as well as they're now 7-1 on the year. This time they beat Wofford in conference play 41-17 as they show that they're a top 10 team in the country. San Diego State also trying to show that they're a top 10 team as well as they handle business again in conference play. This time beating Southern Missouri State 33-21 as the Aztecs now sit at 7-1. So we hop into another top 25 matchup that we got going on as we got Nickel State, who did recently enter the top 25. They are ranked number 25 in the country. They will be taking on the Sam Houston State Cardiac Cats, who come in ranked number 6 in the country. And they have a very dynamic backfield with David Bullock and, of course, the running back that you see on screen right now. you got Mike Miniachi and... This is the game of the week as well, so we will see the pick from Lee Corso. And Corso, he's going to be rocking with them Cognac Cats. They think they're going to come out here on the road and win this football game. We'll see if Frederick McNair and company have something to say about that. If he can get some help from the rest of his team, though, as Richard Carter, one of the backup running backs, got the carry there on that option to the left-hand side. But he puts the ball on the ground. And it's frankly not a great start for either offense. It's really what we've been seeing. Some, some sloppy play from both teams. As we get into the second quarter of action, we have still not seen either team get up on the scoreboard yet. We'll see if David Bullock can change that as he hands it off to Mike Miniachi. He breaks a tackle, breaks a second, a third. Hey, he breaks four tackles. Somebody tell him to get away from the lemonade stand because Mike Miniachi finds his way into the end zone. Touchdown, Sam Houston State. They have barbecue and they didn't tell him. 
hurt my feelings. And now Sam Houston State has a 7-0 lead. David Bullock's going to drop back the pass, so he throws quickly over to the left-hand side. Finds Mike Miniachi once again, who might be on his way to a career performance because he now has two, count it, two long touchdowns. And this one is a not 69, very nice, by the way, yard reception. And the Cardiac Cats, they're looking like a top 10 team here in the United States of America here at the FCS level. Can Nickel State answer the bell, though? They got punched in the mouth early, and it looks like they cannot get out of their way as there was a little bit of miscommunication between Frederick McNair and Deuce Randolph. Two senior starters, by the way. And they put the ball on the ground, so Nickel State down 17 to nothing. Now Frederick McNair forced to throw the football, and don't get me wrong, he does have a pretty good arm on him, but this is not how this offense is simply built. They like to run the football, but if you want to run the football a lot more, you got to have it close or you got to have the lead. We'll see how they change their strategy is now. First and goal from the six-yard line. This time, Frederick McNair does get a successful pitch off and finds Richard Carter, who did have that fumble earlier on in the game he does end up redeeming himself with a touchdown so now 17 to 7 is going to be your score but did nickel state offense get going just a little bit too late mike miniachi gets yet another carry takes it right into the heart of the colonel defense and now we've got a soccer reference because he's got a hat trick and now it's going to be 24 to 7. You're going to be your score as Mike Miniachi now has three touchdowns in this game. So now the fourth quarter ensues as Frederick McNair desperately trying to lead his troops back into this game. We have seen miracles happen before. Do we get a miracle here at home? Can Nickel State prove they are indeed a top 25 team? We're going to find out that and much more as we got a fourth and goal from the seven yard line. It's Reg McNair makes an adjustment at the line of scrimmage, throws towards the end zone and finds his guy. So Frederick McNair gets a touchdown on the board, his first passing touchdown of the game. But too little too late though, as the Cardiac Cats not playing in a game that is going to raise your blood pressure. They win this one. They were leading wire to wire, winning 27 to 14 in this one as Sam Houston State, they continue their excellent season, whereas Nickel State, they will be hanging on the bubble, it seems like, as we get into the final stages of this regular season. Nickel State will now be 5-3 and three on the year, while Sam Houston State, at this point, looks like a virtual lock. They're now going to be 7-1 and one after this top 25 win that just transpired on the road. So we'll see if the top 25 love still continues as we will check in now on Chattanooga hosting Alabama State. And both teams have kind of kind of tread water here in the conference. They both had better non-conference slates than how they performed in conference plays so far. But you know, nothing like trying to go out here and trying to right the ship. And Chattanooga, they are led by Mark Spicer, but Mark Spicer has struggled a little bit as of late. I remember a time when he had 11 touchdowns and just three interceptions. Uh, three touchdowns and 10 interceptions since then. So really important for Mark Spicer and his passing attack to get going here early and often. And that's a good way to get things started. An 82-yard touchdown pass. And that does mean that Mark Spicer... He does get his 15th touchdown pass of the season. He still isn't having that bad of a season if we're keeping it at 100%. There was a Bo McAllister in coverage. You know, linebacker on a wide receiver. Usually does not end too terribly well. As does the case when you fumble the football. Usually not a good look. Chattanooga, they will fall on the fumble recovery and the Chattanooga Mox, they will be plowing forward. They are going to be starting this next drive from the 34-yard line. 
We'll see if they can turn that into a touchdown right away. As Mark Spicer. No, it's going to be a direct snap right away. Hang on now. Some space down the middle of the field. And that last line of a defense coming through. I thought we were going to see a touchdown run there. Very innovative call there. Going with the direct snap when no one was expecting it. And now it's first and goal from the nine yard line. Going back through the air. And Chattanooga finds their end zone. Another touchdown. And you want to add insult to injury. Michael Montgomery, who did help make that touchdown saving tackle on the direct snap. He also gets hurt. Hopefully it's not too serious. But for now, Alabama State's in some trouble. Down 14-3. to three. They're going to have to rely on their senior quarterback. T.Y. Huntley, who is looking for his fellow receiver, Trey Williams. But Matt Washington will get the interception. But he hurts himself too. He's not having himself a great day. Looks like he hurt his wrist or something on his hand you know very important for a corner and now it's still 14 to 3 chattanooga they don't do anything after the interception but alabama state is still down two possessions as ty hunt we trying to throw over to the right hand side and that particular throw wasn't a bad decision i would say trying to get it out to trey williams once again it's just you know if a corner made a great play on the ball i mean it happens sometimes, but now this pretty good offense that Chattanooga has, they're going to try to get going here. And how about this big time catch by Marco Walker? Double coverage, got the end zone boundary to work with as well. So it's essentially three defenders. Now Chattanooga gets to the red zone, and Chattanooga, they have been perfect. They have not gone a red zone trip without getting any points in any game this season that streak will continue they are now 19 for 19 after mark spicer does end up throwing yet another touchdown pass and it's 21 to 3 lead for chattanooga mox 226 left to play here in the second quarter of action as ty Humley will drop back the pass he wants to throw down the field again looking for trey williams he just Put too much on that football. That was a clear overthrow. And this backup safety, who did come into the game after Matt Washington ended up getting injured. And Matt Washington did not appear for the rest of his game. But the backup safety also gets an interception as well. So another extra possession for the Chattanooga Mox, who immediately tries to attack down the length of the field. And that's going to be a touchdown for the Mox. And again, we will see a 28 to 3 lead as Marco Walker. He's certainly feeling himself today. Going into the second half, though, Alabama State, they did have the ball first start the second half of action, but they cannot score their first uh, possession of the third quarter. But we might see Chattanooga be able to do the same thing, though. Beautiful throw over the top um, as Matt Montgomery does come back into the game for the Alabama State Hornets. But there's still a first and goal from the free yard line, though. Tight back up tight end goes into motion. It's going to be, no, a play action end zone. It's caught. The backup tight end who has moved into motion makes the catch in the Chattanooga Mox. They will make this lead even bigger. And I mean, look at the throwing lane that he had. That receiver. He was wide butt naked open. And now it's 35 to 3. I was not expecting this because Chattanooga, they have been down bad. And dare I say it, they have been down horrendous going into this game. But hey, to give the mock some credit, they came to play. And Alabama State down big. 38 to 3 is your score. But T.Y. Huntley not going to give up. He does finally connect. With his star receiver, Trey Williams. And to be fair, Trey Williams has been no slouch in this game either. Five catches, 158 yards. Just has not found that end zone yet. Although the Hornets are pretty good at doing that. Once they get into the red zone. Dropping back. Look, and it's the backup quarterback in the game. Finds Trey Williams, that senior receiver again. And there it is. That touchdown grab for Trey Williams, who gets close to 200 yards in this one. So he's been a bright spot. Must have been a pretty rough day for Alabama State so far. But it does look like it is not going to get that much better 
at least not anytime soon. That's another big catch down the sideline as Marco Walker gets into the shotgun formation, throws down the right-hand side, finds his receiver, and it's caught! Touchdown, Chattanooga! And the Max are going to be storming on as Chattanooga gets another one up on the board. 45-10. to 10. This has turned into a very unexpected route, I will say. I mean, backup quarterback will stay in the game, but he can't do much better. He throws an interception as well, and it also does have to be taken back to the crib. Nick Freeman really going to be living in the dreams and nightmares of these Alabama State quarterbacks. Uh, when they go to sleep tonight, I'll tell you what, uh, once they get back on campus, because Chattanooga wins very convincingly. They win 72 to 10, and Mark Spicer ends up with six touchdown passes. So we'll see if Eastern Kentucky can have that same level of dominance as they will be taking on a lesser conference opponent here. They'll be taking on the Tennessee State Tigers. The Tennessee State, they are the only team that you look at as the clear-cut worst team in the Big Ten Conference, but you know what they say in this beautiful game of college football any given Saturday. And, you know, we've seen some pretty crazy upsets already this year. Like, remember when Wofford, of all teams, beat Sam Houston State? So cannot, and I really mean when I say this, we cannot write down the Tennessee State Tigers as automatic losers in this game, right? But we'll see how things shake out when we actually play the game because plays games aren't always decided on paper but honestly starting how i expected things to start a 71 yard touchdown pass good start here early for a team that is also trying to keep uh pace with southeast missouri state you know lots quite a few teams that are in the hunt to win that conference title and you know the importance of winning the conference title down here at the fcs if you when your conference you automatically get a spot into the fcs playoffs which is the term how it determines how you win that nat go for that national championship game or get an opportunity to win it but lewis rose wants to make sure that tennessee state never believes to begin with 84 yard touchdown from somebody that was a guy that was on the preseason high has been watching well he hasn't had the most impressive season as the running back his team has still have been pretty successful over the course of this year and does get a little bit of a stat pad there well as well so 14 to 3 year score and you know it's going to be a great day when even the fullback is going to get a lot of yards well, i mean look at this carter all by himself hey mr carter how have you been he gets a big gain there which always nice to see the fullbacks get involved but Louis Rose, this is his show, runs away briefly from Marcellus Wallace before the senior custom at the cornerback position makes the touchdown saving tackle, but how long will it take for Eastern Kentucky to punch it in? They are, of course, going to be on the one yard line. They go back to the fullback and the fullback punches it in. Touchdown, Eastern Kentucky. And I'm sure somewhere out there, not the expert is smiling. Especially when you get those fullbacks involved. Two touches. Multiple touches for the fullback. You don't see that very often here in the modern college football game. And Tennessee State in some serious trouble right now. 21-3 is going to be your score. And they will have to punt this football away. Hal Halderman, not a great punter. At least not having a great game so far. Averaging less than 37 yards of punt and it looks like this one isn't great either punted into the quarter and this one is going to be taken right back to the crib eastern kentucky once again gets another point score up on that scoreboard and now eastern kentucky in complete control and when eastern kentucky has these significant leads that's when they are the most dangerous they're not going to give up very many big leads if they do at all because they do have that vaunted running game. Louis Rose taking it down the sideline. Doesn't even get touched on this particular carry. Well, I guess towards the end he did. But for the most part, he was completely untouched. And Cameron Coates will even get a rushing touchdown as well. Marcellus Wallace this time could not make the touchdown saving tackle. He did make one earlier against Louis Rose. 
but it's going to be 42 to 3 though and tennessee state frankly looking like a team that is the worst team in the conference i mean gotta keep it real uh not sure what happened to tennessee state they got some dudes on this team just they did not show up whatsoever and it's really been a down year for the tigers i will say that uh they haven't been a big playoff blue blood but i did expect better from tennessee state than the two and five season that they got right now so we head back into the studio now as we check in on other fcs games uh here in this dynasty and portland state finally gets itself back to 500 even though they've been ranked the entire time they beat idaho state 28 to 23 in order to bolster their conference resume but as for arkansas pine bluff though they take a shocking upset here at home losing to the tigers of grambling state Grambling State wins 34 to 31 as Arkansas Pine Bluff, they do end up losing their third game of the season. But we do have a huge blowout happen in this dynasty. It seems like we're getting quite a few blowouts here in this episode. Youngstown State though destroys Jacksonville State 58 to 7 as Youngstown State gets itself to 500 while Jacksonville State falls to 3 and 5. So we know for sure that the sun has set and we might have arguably our most intriguing games that are not involving like necessarily top 25 matchups. We got Alcorn State going up against Texas Southern and this could very potentially be a conference championship game matchup. Texas Southern of course has to go through Western Carolina eventually a couple weeks down the line. Could even be next week but Alcorn State has control of their own destiny right now to get to the conference championship game and therefore their first fcs playoff appearance we'll see if they can take down texas southern and possibly make that statement that they're looking for but we all know this solomon less he is a certified bad man as he does make that huge catch to get things going here late in the first quarter of action as adam mayhew who has been a little bit inconsistent as a quarterback, so Solomon West stats has suffered because of that. But we do see Adam Mayhew trying to scramble. Can he find his way into the end zone? And he does. Texas Southern does find the end zone, and that will be a touchdown for the Texas Southern Tigers. So that will end up being a 7 0 lead for them. So we'll see if Alcorn State has a response in hand as Alcorn State trying to get a little bit tricky now. Rob Robertson trying to set up the reverse, but Texas Southern, they are simply not fooled as they are going up against one of the top defenses in the country. Texas Southern, number one in total yards allowed, allowing less than 150 yards allowed as you find out the hard way why this defense is simply not to be messed with and that was an absolutely bone crushing hit no surprise that rob robertson let go of the football i honestly would have to i'm surprised he didn't sustain some kind of concussion and look at what texas southern does they go tricky they go the halfback pass with one of their running backs and it works it actually freaking works that is a 50 yard touchdown for Roderick Murray and how about this a little bit of a lot Damian Tomlinson in him man you love to see it as now Alcorn State finds itself down 14 to nothing early Rod Robertson comes back out onto the field does find his receiver though as he does make the catch and that will be a first down for the Alcorn State Braves in this one they're trying to brave the storm later on in the drive third and long robertson loading up towards the end zone it's caught it's caught touchdown alcorn state and that's the biggest thing when you're on the road you're an underdog right you gotta weather that initial storm they certainly braved it and alcorn state they're certainly not done they still have a chance to win this game they are down by 10 and it helps when your quarterback can make that type of throw i'll tell you what that is a absolutely big time throw there over the shoulder able to get to a couple extra yards after the catch because of that and now rod robertson 
Drops back again. Throws on a right hand side, and it's caught again. First down for the Alcorn State Braves. And they are certainly driving as they want to send a message to this number four team in America. They came to play too. Robinson looks to the right hand side, but it's intercepting Nick Adams. Getting his first interception of the season. And that is a huge momentum shifting interception. If Alcorn State scores on this drive, we're talking about a one possession game. But now instead, Texas Southern, they could go for an early dagger. Mayhew drops back. He's got a clean pocket. Fires and it's caught by your one of your guys' customs, Solomon West. And you can't allow Adam Mayhew to have a clean pocket like that. Because a lot of quarterbacks, if you give them a clean pocket, they can do some damage to you. And that's what we just saw right there. So Texas Southern, they do extend their lead. Is now Rod Robertson going to have to rely on his right shoulder and arm. Does he have that certified dog in him to lead this comeback? 325. Left to play in the game. There's a third and five. Robinson faces pressure, but still throws a rocket. Touchdown, Alcorn State. And that offensive line gave him just enough time to get a touchdown in there. But the comeback attempt will ultimately fall short as Texas Southern. They will run out the rest of his clock and also get a field goal with the very last play of the game. I don't know why they chose to do that, but probably to get a little bit more style points which is more important in college football than in any other sport to be honest so texas southern they're now gonna be seven and one and i just checked the little preview for next week they're gonna battle western carolina in the next episode game of the year implications but first we will jump into the final gameplay that we got here in this week 10 episode a conference matchup in the big 10 we got tennessee tech taken on southeast missouri state tennessee tech they looked pretty good in non-conference they came into conference play undefeated they were three and oh you know maybe a sleeper to make the playoffs now they're four and three and they're looking like a long shot right now but that doesn't mean that they can play spoiler uh they just gotta win out here and they can put themselves right back in this conversation so needless to say this is a big game here for tennessee tech as Southeast Missouri State tries to get the first points on the board. Can they draw first blood? And they don't. Tennessee Tech gets the interception. Travis Johnson, the custom quarterback. He had his receiver open. He got him. But he threw that football too late. And because he threw that football just a little bit too late, it ended up being costly. And that is a real difference maker, you know one second too early or too late and it leads to incompletions or interceptions sometimes that's why gain of inches you know that's more than just a cliche that's actually true especially when you get into conference games conference games they do tend to be a little bit tighter than you know those non-conference games that we end up seeing early on in the season but Southeast Missouri State, though, they will take a 10-0 lead. But it's been a pretty defensive battle, though. I haven't really seen a lot of offensive action. But Travis Johnson will go ahead and open things up here. He gets a big-time throw in the right-hand side. And that ends up being a 75-yard touchdown. And Travis Johnson had a guy in his face, too. He was about to get hit, too, as he threw that football. So I really applaud him for having that pocket presence there. At Southeast Missouri State, they build their lead. Now 20 to nothing now as Johnson looks over to the left-hand side. It is completed, but we do see a fumble on the foot on the ground in Tennessee Tech. They will end up recovering that fumble, actually. So 20 to nothing, still your lead, but Tennessee Tech, they can try to work themselves back into this game, and that throw does help them out quite a bit back of the end zone big time throw here as well but obviously tennessee tech did not score enough points because the red hawks have an elite defense they have one of the best defenses in the entire country and while the offense didn't live up to the standard here today southeast missouri state they still very much controlled their own destiny in terms of 
how things shake out in conference play. They're six and two, and they have sole possession of first place in the conference. So they are certainly on track right now to get an automatic bid into the FCS playoffs here in year five. But before we go ahead and check out that Sports Illustrated magazine, we have two more major games that we got to talk about. Defending national champions, man, Georgia Southern, they are not looking like a defending champ. They lose again here, this time to McNeese State, 29 to 17 in the Georgia Southern Eagles. They're just four and four on the season after this loss. In addition to Northern Arizona Lumberjacks win their game by a final score of 27 to 20 as Northern Arizona now at five and two looks pretty good to get back into the FCS playoffs. So this is the Sports Illustrated magazine that did just recently come out, right? Um, so Western Carolina, they're still hanging on to that number one spot. They're hanging on by a friend though as that near loss to Alabama and uh, might have damaged their legitimacy a little bit, but a win is a win. And now we'll go ahead and check out those conference standings now. So we'll start things off in the Atlantic division for the ACC. And I'm only going to highlight, you know, like the conference races. I'm not going to go too terribly in depth, or at least I don't think. So right now, Florida A&M sits on top as of right now, but watch out for Delaware and South Carolina State. They're both pretty good football programs in their own right, and they're right on Florida A&M's heels, who are honestly in a pretty unfamiliar situation. They've never been to the FCS playoffs before. As for, as for the Coastal, it does seem like James Madison does have it pretty locked down. Delaware State was up in top, but they did lose a couple of games in a row, so now James Madison, they're in complete control of this division and expect them to be in the conference championship game. As for the Big Ten Conference, there is no conference championship game for the Big Ten, but it looks like it's turning into a free team race. Southeast Missouri State still on top. They got the undefeated record as of right now, but Sanford is not too far behind. They're 4-1 in conference play. And then your defending conference champions, Eastern Kentucky, they're also in the fray as well. They're currently sitting at 4-1 in the Big Ten Conference. For the Big 12 North, even though Alcorn State just lost their conference game, they are still you know, sitting pretty in order to get to that conference championship game, give themselves a shot to go uh, to their first FCS playoff appearance. But it does close the gap between them and Grambling State and Arkansas Pine Bluff, who are sitting just a game behind. Meanwhile, for the South, it's been turning into a two-team two race, which will ultimately be decided in the next episode. A little bit of spoiler for y'all. It's Western Carolina sitting at number one in the country. We'll be taking on Texas Southern, who's the number four team in the country. They're both undefeated in conference play. As for the Big East, the Big East once again with the Brown Bears in there. They're 4-0 in conference play, but ranked in the top 25. So shout out to the Ivy League. Finally getting a team ranked in the top 25. Uh, Yale is in here as well. They're the closest team, but they're not eligible for the FCS playoffs. So even if they do win the Ivy League, they would not be going to the playoffs because of their current sanctions. As for the Conference USA East Division, things are still pretty relatively tight as of right now. Eastern Carolina sits at the very top at the moment with a 4-1 conference record. Richmond is about a half game behind. They are still in it to win it, but they will need some help from Eastern Carolina if they want to go to the conference championship game. Meanwhile, over in the West, it looks like SMU is in here as of right now, but they are under a two-year probation, which they just started this year. So if it does end up being that SMU makes the conference championship game, whoever wins this Eastern division automatically goes, no matter what happens in that conference championship game. But there is some people that are close by. Villanova's in there. They have a 4-2 conference record. Uh, they're going to look to try to make a big push. Uh, don't sleep on Rice and Tulane either. Uh, they can make a run too. As for the IA Independence, uh, nobody ranked in the top 25 among the independent schools, but Temple is the closest as of right now. They sit at 6-2 at the moment. For the MAC Eastern Division, Akron pretty much has this locked up. They are sitting number two in the entire country. They've been one of the most consistent teams in the entire nation. Whereas in the Western Division, things are a little bit less clear. Eastern Michigan has the advantage right now, 4-0 in conference play. Central Michigan is in that fray as well. They're just a game back, but they don't have nearly as impressive as a record. 
for the Mountain West. Mountain West is also pretty tight as well, turning into a free team race overall between San Diego State, who's 5-1. The Kangaroos of University of Missouri, Kansas City, they have a 4-1 conference record. And then UNLV, who just got into the top 25, actually, they have a 4-1 conference record, too. Now, for the Pac-12, it is turning into a two-team race. And it looks like Sacramento State is leading the way. 4-0 conference record as of right now. They only have Northern Arizona that's holding a candle to them at the moment. Who has that 3-1 conference record and are also sitting in the top 10 in the entire country. As for the SEC East, honestly, one of the most disrespected teams in the entire country right now. I mean, look at their record. They are 7-1 in a power five conference you know at least like in, in fcs standards and they're still not ranked now i don't know if they're receiving votes because i haven't had the chance to take a look at like who's receiving votes who isn't but texas state not being ranked that's currently a crime hopefully they change that if the texas state bobcats keep winning and they look like a lock to go to the conference championship game as for who texas state would go ahead and face up against Right now, it's a two-team race between Sam Houston State and Northwestern State, who aren't currently tied at the moment with a 4-1 conference record. Sam Houston State does have the tiebreaker vote because we have seen those two teams played, and those Cardiac Cats did end up coming out on top, so that's something to think about. Uh, a team to watch out for, though, is Southeastern. They have a 3-2 conference record, putting together a solid season. Be interesting to see if they make a good run, as well as the Elon Phoenix see if elon can come out here and play a little bit of spoiler as well now for the sun belt the sun belt does not have an automatic bid but there's two teams to watch out for that could sneak in an at large bid because it's not a particularly great at large field this year ul lafayette the raging cajuns are one team they're five and two right now and then north texas is also in this category as well they're five and two as well but have lost two of their last three games and then, of course, to wrap things up is the WAC Conference. Utah State currently undefeated as of right now, but there is one other team that is, well, I guess a couple of other teams that are kind of close. Oral Roberts is in the discussion. They've had, quietly had a pretty good season. 6-3 and three with a 5-2 and two conference record, but being in a smaller conference could hurt them in terms of getting in as an at-large team. That's just the name of the game. And then New Mexico State, who was in the top 25, but did lose to Stephen F. Austin. That first conference loss of the season puts them one game back as well, but still have a pretty good season too. They're sitting at six and two. So guys, I will try to put some emphasis on those conference championship races because that is just one of two ways that you can punch your ticket into the FCS playoffs. And guys, we are just a few episodes away from playoff action. We're getting closer, guys. We're getting closer to that pivotal playoff push. And I hope you guys are excited finding out what 24 teams will be included in the field this year and i hope you guys are excited for that because i'm certainly am man and if you guys are excited as i am man i need you guys to do me a favor smack that like button for me hit that subscribe button as well if you do happen to be brand spanking new to the channel this is john Shea gaming on the mic signing off but i'm hoping you're all out there having a good one take care everybody